How do the images in Revelation work? One of the main reasons why Revelation is so difficult to understand is because it is almost entirely filled with images from start to finish. It opens with John recounting his vision. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Notice how John dramatizes this scene with an image. I heard a loud voice like a trumpet. Now picture the scene there. There's someone behind you with a trumpet and they just let loose. You'd be startled and most likely jump right out of your skin and probably lose a few years off your life expectancy as well. When John turns around, the scene only gets more spectacular in verses 12 through 17. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Look at all the images contained in these four and a half verses. Seven golden lampstands, one like a son of man, wearing a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. His hair was white like wool or snow. Hmm. Very biblical. Eyes like a flame, feet like polished bronze. His voice was like that of many waters. He holds seven stars in his hands and a sword comes out of his mouth and his face was like the shining sun. And to top it all off, John falls like a dead man at his feet. Almost 600 years ago, Albrecht Dürer made his fortune by publishing a short book with 15 woodcuts I did, Diagrams on the Apocalypse, or Revelation. The year was 1498, and many in Europe thought that the last judgment depicted in Revelation was just around the corner. They feared that a possible invasion by the Ottoman Empire would bring civilization to an end. Durer's little book on Revelation found a very receptive audience during that day when it was published. But I digress. What I want to do is look at just one image from the book, his depiction of the scene that we just read. Durer reads and depicts this scene in a very literal manner. Jesus actually has seven stars in his hand. A double-edged sword is coming right out of his mouth. And Durer takes the metaphorical image that John employs and depicts them in a rather realistic and literal manner. By doing so, Durer illustrates for us that we should not read these images in a literal and flat-footed manner, but see them as metaphorical images. My name is David Paris, and you're watching The Caffeinated Bible. Can you imagine if I had named it The Decaffeinated Bible? Black. Just hot brown water that doesn't get you where you want to go. So, I'd appreciate if you took a moment to subscribe and share these videos with other people that you know. That's a great way to help me grow this channel. I should also mention that I got the flu shot a few hours ago. I know, bad timing on my part. And I'm feeling a bit under the weather right now. So please bear with me if I'm not my normal chipper self in this video. The ancient Near East and the Greco-Roman Empire were cultures that were saturated with visual images. These images were depicted on walls, streets, buildings, frescoes and houses, temples, everyday plates that you ate off of, coins, and in texts. The challenge that we face today as readers of the Bible is that we no longer share this vocabulary of visual images that they would have employed and understood in that day. We need to research what these images meant and how they were used in that day and that culture. The best way I know to help you grasp how these images functioned 
is to compare them to our use of political cartoons today. All you have to do is scan through a newspaper and you're going to see all kinds of symbols and images to communicate something about our culture or politics. These symbols are embedded in our culture and they convey a great deal of meaning and significance. The elephant and the donkey are two well-known symbols in American culture. I don't even have to explain to you that these refer to the Republican and Democratic parties. Because you're embedded in this culture, you immediately know what these symbols refer to. Now I have a couple political cartoons that I'm going to show you here that help us think through this a bit more. This image is a bear jumping up and down on what looks like a pile of blocks. But by sticking the word Chechnya there, we know that this refers to a republic in the USSR. But what about the bear saying, it's a habit from my old superpower days? This immediately helps us know that this refers to Russia. And also the bear is a symbol within our culture to refer to Russia. But there's nothing about Russia that makes it a bear. It's a symbol that we use to refer to Russia. If we don't recognize the cultural background behind these images, then we run into problems. For example, consider this second political cartoon. Most people will recognize that we have an image of Lady Justice here. Now this cartoon is based upon an image that has a very rich and long history. Themis in Greek mythology was a titan that guaranteed fairness in judgments and law. Associated with her were the scales and the sword. Why? The scales symbolized that she fairly balanced the needs of both parties in arriving at a judgment. And the sword represented the enforcement of the law or her judgments. By the time of Christ, she was a common symbol on many Roman coins as well. During the 15th century, the blindfold was added to this metaphorical image. It represents that she doesn't look at those presenting their cases before her, but she fairly weighs both sides of the case. She's impartial and objective. She's not influenced by seeing the wealth, power, or status of the individuals before her. But let's get back to our cartoon here. Notice in this image, she doesn't have a blindfold on. Themis is no longer blind, but now she's cheating. She's looking at one of the individuals when we can't see. Now I need to provide a little bit more information here so you understand what's going on. The pattern in the background there is a map of Poland. I took this cartoon from the Polish version of sort of Time Magazine while I was teaching there in the 1990s. And what this cartoon conveys is that justice in Poland is skewed. It is not fair and it needs to be reformed. But you would not know this without having the cultural background of what a map of Poland looks like. Or understand that Lady Justice has a scale and a sword and she should have a blindfold on. The same thing is true for the images in Revelation and other texts in the Bible. We need to know the historical context and the background behind these books to accurately understand what they refer to. When we look at Revelation, I think we need to ask two questions to unlock these images. The first question is, are these images similar to images in the Hebrew scriptures? Remember that John and most of the first generation leaders in the church came from a Jewish background and they cut their teeth on concepts found in the Old Testament. The second question is, does this image have a wider historical or cultural background that helps us interpret this image? Oftentimes, these two questions will overlap. Most, if not all, of the images and symbolism in Revelation were widely known in the ancient Near East, not just within a Jewish culture. Let's take a look at a famous example out of Revelation 13 as a case study, the beast that comes up out of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads seems to have suffered a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. 
And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? In chapter 13, John is not explicitly saying that the emperor is the Antichrist. To actually say that in that culture would have meant John's death, and most likely the death of anyone who possessed a copy of the book of Revelation. A common concept throughout many of these cultures in that region was the symbol of a beast that comes up out of the sea that would wage war or oppose God's forces in heaven. Isaiah 27 is a great example of this from the Old Testament. In that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. So when John mentions the beast in Revelation 13, his readers would have immediately known that this creature stands in opposition to God. He doesn't need to say anything more about it for them to get the point. They would have gotten this from their Old Testament background, but also from the Greco-Roman and the wider ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. Layer on top of this a slightly more specific metaphorical image of this beast. During John's day, the Roman Empire was often depicted as the beast that comes up out of the sea to wage war. Why? The Roman Empire was centered around the Mediterranean Sea, and they used the Mediterranean Sea as a quick way to transport their troops. This is how they were able to get their armies around in many instances. They could quickly and easily transport thousands of troops from one corner of the Roman Empire to another. The fall of Israel in 70 AD is a great example of this. Rome was able to transport thousands of troops to Israel, many of them landing in the port city of Caesarea. Imagine living in Caesarea during that day. Yesterday, you thought that Israel might possibly be able to gain its independence from the man. Then this morning when you wake up and you go down to the city center and you look out in the harbor, all that you see are hundreds of Roman troop transport ships coming into the harbor and all across the horizon. The beast was coming up out of the sea to wage war on God's chosen nation. Not only does this image communicate that this beast stands in opposition to God, but given the additional correspondence during John's day that represents the Roman Empire, this would have been a very strong image that John's audience would have immediately grasped. In verse 3, John mentions that one of his heads seems to have had a mortal wound, but this mortal wound was healed. Now, I mentioned in a previous video that a myth developed after Nero's death or suicide, that he would return like a Messiah-type figure and would restore the Roman Empire to its former glory. John picks up this myth surrounding Nero's death in this passage. It's not that John believed Nero actually came back to life or that this myth was fulfilled. Rather, Nero and his mythical status presents John with a perfect model of the Antichrist. Nero's vicious persecution of the church in Rome provides a framework to understand the work of the beast, especially its opposition and hostility towards the church. If we scroll down a little bit further to verse 11, we meet a second beast. This time, this beast is on the land. This beast exercises authority on behalf of the first beast and makes the people worship the first beast. The way that Rome exercised authority during that day was through local rulers and leaders. Herod and his sons were Rome's vassal rulers in Israel. In Ephesus, it would have been the governor, the aristocracy, and the wealthy members of society there. They made sure that the local populace obeyed and recognized that they were part of the Roman Empire. And in particular, they promoted the worship of the Roman Empire through temples and its rulers. This is where the rub comes for the Christians in John's churches. As monotheists who confessed that there was one Lord and God, Jesus Christ, how could they participate in the worship of the emperor or Caesar without committing blasphemy? It's not just the beast that comes up out of the sea or the Roman Empire that's the danger here, but the beast on the land as well. 
the local leaders and rulers within your city. And the second beast demonstrates the dangers when aristocracy, the wealthy, or the political leaders sacrifice their social and religious conscience for prosperity, peace, or their own political gains. In their worship of the emperor, we see a deification of power, a dangerous mix which history has demonstrated over and over again. So where can you go to find this cultural and historical background information to help you read a book like Revelation? A good, solid commentary on the book of Revelation is a great place to start. And a commentary is simply a book that is written to explain the text. I have four books that I recommend to people when they have questions about the book of Revelation. And I will have links to these books in the show more section if you would like to purchase one of these. Now the first one that I would like to recommend is George Eldon Ladd's A Commentary on the Revelation of John. He goes through the book of Revelation verse by verse, so you don't have to read the whole book. You can just go to, let's say, Revelation 13 and read what he has to say about that. Almost everything that Ladd wrote is very balanced and clear, and this book is not an exception. The second one is slightly different. It's Richard Balcom's The Theology of the Book of Revelation. Balcom takes a macro view of the book of Revelation, and he looks at the themes and ideas of the book of Revelation that run from sort of cover to cover, but also themes in particular passages. Really well written. The third is the book of Revelation by Robert Mount. This is a commentary once again, and it's much deeper than Lads. It dives in a little bit much deeper, has a little bit of Greek in it, and it's more extensive than the other two books. So if you really want to dive deep, you can pick this one up. And finally, I have a fourth book that I recommend. I don't have a print copy of it, and that's Revelation, an Introduction and Commentary by Ian Paul. This is the most recent of the three being published in 2018. Now I should give a disclaimer here that Ian is a friend of mine, but that's not why I'm recommending his book. Ian's commentary is a good solid commentary on Revelation that is not overly academic, but gives a thorough treatment of the entire book. And like Ladd and Malthus, you can just pick it up and look at the particular passage that you're interested in to see what he says about it. For more difficult passages or sections in the book, he has an additional notes section that dives deeper into those particular sections. I hope that this video has whet your appetite to study the book of Revelation more and has given you some gateways into the book. Don't forget to check out my other videos on Revelation. Remember to subscribe, give it a thumbs up and share it with other people. I would really appreciate that and that helps me a great deal. Until we meet again, peace.